look, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Artists' Well. This is episode 51. And for a change, I'm actually visiting the artist, the guest artist, uh, in his studio, which is the first. I think I've only visited three people out of 50. And um, so this is a bit of a novelty for me. And such a lovely day it is, too. So where we are is we are in the north side of Dublin, across the Liffey, in a very historic area. And I know that because if you look at all the place names, the street names or road names, you've got the like of Citric Place, you've got Norseman's Road, um, you've got uh, Olaf, uh, all sorts of names like that, and Viking Place as well. So um, that's the sort of area we're in, very historic. And this is the studio of my guest artist, and I've just come to his um, door now. So I'm going to reverse my camera and ring the bell. Right, here we are. Right, this man needs very little introduction other than he is, um, he's been an artist for 50, 60 years. He's designed more than 50 stamps and banknotes. Uh, he's created the sets for Riverdance. Um, he has done portraits of political figures and so on. And here he is himself, Robert Ballard. Good morning. How are you? Lovely morning. It's super morning. And thank you very much for letting me into your your, oh, your sanctuary here. Yeah, thank you. So you lead on there, Robert. Okay. We're sorted through the storage area here. Yeah, we might come back to that. <laughs> All right. The working space. Excellent. This is wonderful, wonderful space. Yeah, it's nice, yeah. And, uh, nice and bright, and uh, specifically built uh, as a studio mm -hmm. uh, with uh, north light and everything you're supposed to have. Excellent. How long are you here? 30, 35 years. I, um, I bought this, uh, and uh, th there was just the house at the front, and, yeah. and this yard at the back where the studio is now. Yes. And... Uh, do you know what it was? Uh, now, it, there was someone here before me, but what it was, was um, that's the pig farm. Really? Uh, yeah. And uh, behind the big wall out there was another pig farm, two pig farms beside one another. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the pig farm on this side had long ceased, but uh, the one on the other side of this wall continued for many years. Uh, so I lived beside a pig farm for well, worked. Worked, yeah. Time. And and you live fairly nearby, don't you? I live in, in Broadstone, which is only five, ten minutes walk away. That's All right, okay. Yeah. 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 Very good. Um, let's start off, because we're going to do a tour of your studio, um, see some of your work, uh, look at some materials that you use and so on. But before we do that, can we talk a little bit about your early career? Because I know you really didn't start out as an artist. Not at all. No. no. Where did you start? I mean, you studied architecture first? Yeah. Um, I had an interesting kind of situation uh, in that when I was finishing off school, mm -hmm. uh, I had one of those. I was, a, by the way, an only child, so there was only one of me. And I had one of these meetings with my parents to discuss what I would do after school. Yes. And uh, uh, I always remember my mother uh, saying, uh, we will encourage you and support you in anything you want to do as long as it's not art. <laughs> the old story, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, now I wasn't that perturbed, mm. I have to say myself, yeah. right, what I wanted to do. Mm. I mean, the one thing I was interested in then was music. I, I was playing in a, you know, an amateur mm. group at the time. They were well known. No, no, man, no, that was later. Oh, that was later. Okay. That was late. yeah. 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 No, they, 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 a few kind of small groups, you know? Yes. Like all kids start off that way. Uh, but um, uh, I decided, I picked architecture because of that, that seemed to suit some part of my temperament. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, I did three years in, in Bolton Street um, College, College of Technology, as it's mm -hmm. called there. Uh, and I have to say, I enjoyed most of it. I was very fortunate in my first two years to have the architect uh, Robin Walker as mm -hmm. my tutor, no. who had just come back from the States and ha he had been working with the famous uh, architect Mies van der Rohe. Uh, so he came back fueled with enormous enthusiasm for modern architecture and everything yes. and passed it on to his students. So mm -hmm. I was very keen in all of that. In the third year, 
I didn't have him and I had tutors, some who seemed to appreciate what I was trying to do, others who certainly didn't appreciate what mm. I was trying to do. Yes. And we kind of ended up at loggerheads towards the end of my third year. Mm. And by that stage, I had joined uh, that band you mentioned, the Chessmen, the Chessmen yeah. who had uh, coincidentally at the same time decided to, to turn professional. Mm. So overnight, I ceased being a student and became a professional musician. So you never finished? I never finished. Okay. No. And what instrument did you play? I played the bass guitar. Then oh, right. I started off as, as a kid and I taught myself how to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know why I kind of moved across or on or back yeah. to, yes. to yeah. the bass guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we bass guitarists always insist that the bass guitarist in all the bands is the, the most intellectual and superior of the of course. In the band. Of course. And how long, how long did, you, did you play with them for? Uh, I would say about uh, half a dozen years. Uh, oh, right. I, I finally got exhausted with it, mm. from mostly from the traveling. I didn't mind the playing mm -hmm. uh, uh, in those days. And like when you're professional, you have to play every night of the week if mm. you could get a, an engagement. Yes. And uh, the roads, people forget the roads in Ireland were desperate then. And, uh, you know, uh, Several, several friends, colleagues mm. were killed in car crash, and, you know, in yeah. crashes yes. late at night, coming oh, rushing back from some engagement in the country. In the middle of the night. In the middle of yeah. the night. So mm. that kind of wore on me. And then the other thing that happened around that time was the discovery of, or invention of, or the taking up of country and Irish music. I detest it then and I still do it today. <laughs> so I remember after one night somewhere playing in, I don't know, somewhere in the country, mm -hmm. uh, I discovered at the end of the night that we hadn't played one tune that I liked in the whole night. <laughs> and I said, this is a folks game. And now that I retired. <laughs> I see. Uh, and yeah. uh, uh, the, the only interesting aspect of that was on my retirement, decided to sell all my equipment, my amplifiers and, uh, and, my, and my instrument. And I sold my bass guitar to Philip Limit. Did you? Uh, who, uh, so if I didn't achieve international success as a musician, so uh, all the old photographs of Phil mm. Harry Street mm. has uh, a version of my guitar. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, it was a Fender bass guitar. Yes, quite, yes. Quite, quite well-known basically sure. but uh, yeah. i remember going to because i got i knew phil quite well i went to see them playing uh, at a dance summer mm. uh, in, when they were in ireland and and lo and behold he was playing another mm. uh, bass guitar and afterwards i asked where's my guitar phil he said it was stolen in england <laughs> so i don't know where it is now all right and then what what brought you into the world of art was, was it michael farrell yeah, what, what yeah. happened was when I retired from the music, uh, I think much to the irritation of my mother, uh, I, uh, I had a bit, of, a bit of money because believe it or not, show bands earned quite a lot of yes, money yes. in those days. And uh, so I continued a kind of lifestyle of staying in bed all day and going <laughs> to pubs at night and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and never even dawned on me to get a job or anything. And one of the pubs I used to frequent was Toner's in, in Marion Row. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a lot of friends there. And one night, Tim Goulding, the artist, who was a friend of mine, yes. uh, came up to me and said, Michael Farrell, the art, who, who quite a reputation then, mm -hmm. is, is in the bar. And he's looking for someone to work with him on, mm -hmm. on a, a big project he had. Now, at that stage, I mean, I wasn't an artist. I yeah. was a retired musician. Yes. But anyway, Tim introduced me to Michael, and Michael said, would I uh, be interested in working on this project with him? Uh, oh, no, he said, uh, uh, are you an artist? I said, no. And he said, well, can you draw a straight line? And I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> he said, OK. He said, well, I tell you what the deal is. He said, a fiver a week and all the drink you can take. <laughs> So, to, uh, yeah. you know, somebody in their 20s, that was quite an attractive uh, Very much so. position. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I signed up and worked with Michael for a couple of months. Yeah. These very large paintings he was doing for the National Bank, mm. who had their whole headquarters then in College Green. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think both were two big pictures. One of 
they were both about 30 feet by 20 feet. I mean, they were mm. very big. Yes. And the only place he could get that was big enough to, to do these pictures yeah. was Ardmore Film Studios. So he rented a space oh. in Ardmore Studios. And that was kind of great fun. Uh, every, he, was, he was living uh, with his family in the house. He rented a house mm. in uh, Killiney. So I would come out from town, pick him up in Kalani very early in the morning mm. and then go out to Ardmore in Bray yeah. and start working on these. And, and now we, he was very professional in that regard. We worked very hard. Yes. Yes. And, uh, but then come finishing time, we would repair to the bar in Ardmore. Yeah. And I remember uh, the time we were there, they were making a movie with um, Peter O'Toole and of course, Michael and Peter O'Toole took to one another like yucks to water. Yes. yes. So there was great drinking sessions with uh, Peter okay. O'Toole and Michael. And was that on site or? or, or yes, so it, was a bar, it was a bar in, oh, in Armour Studios. Yeah. Right. Uh, he, he was, O'Toole was making the country dance with Catherine Hepburn. Oh. Uh, but uh, I never met Catherine Hepburn. She wasn't interested in pints at the bar. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> And how long did that uh, arrangement? I, I think we were we worked on that project for two two and a half months. I, I, okay. I don't remember exactly. Oh, right. And I suppose that triggered an interest in me uh, in that you know I was with an artist at mm. all that time of you know a serious professional artist and yes. the notion of being an artist because I didn't know what to do with myself to tell the truth mm. uh, uh, rubbed off on me and I resolved that then to to do that to the full time yeah yeah so w w when you when you can stop there what did you do i mean did you did you go straight into just doing your own work or were you looking for commissions or? I, I was I, I i was going out with us as we say yeah with the, the woman who would eventually become my wife uh, yes and we, we decided to go to england oh, did just you? fed up with ireland and, yeah uh, uh, and we were in london for a couple of months and i remember uh, we we sat down a bunch of grapes was the name of the pub mm. uh, on the Brompton Road. Yes, <laughs> yes. We sat down this night and said, "This isn't working." And yeah. So yeah. I, I remember we said uh, that we go back to Dublin, we get married. Artist. The first two were easy. <laughs> <laughs> the second took a bit of time. <laughs> yes, know? yes, yes. Well, but I, I, I needed a job then. I, I suppose. And was uh, Betty working? Uh, she was working up to the yeah. up till we went. Her, her, she used to joke that she worked in New York. Yes. Her father was manager of the New York Dry Cleaners. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember them. Yeah. They're still there. Well, they're not. Yeah. Well, they... But uh, God. anyway, uh, we, um, we came back and I needed a job. And the only kind of qualifications I had was uh, were as an um, uh, architectural draftsman. Or a... yeah. So I got a, an engineering firm who, who specialised in uh, making aluminium windows for office blocks mm. and stuff like that. So, yes. and, and it's it's funny to uh, to uh, walk around Dublin now and some of the buildings that have my windows in them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, some, they're not of the highest quality, but, yeah. but the windows are still there. But you didn't install them now, Robert. Oh, no, I just designed them. Just <laughs> okay. designed them. The other thing that I mm. found quite poignant the other day driving along mm -hmm. uh, towards Stephen's Green, I see that... Uh, there's hoardings all around Kevin Street, the tech in Kevin Street, and they're, I presume they're going to demolish it. Mm -hmm. And the first job I ever had was when I was an architectural student, was in the summer holidays. I got a job in an architectural firm working on the drawings for Kevin Street. Did you? So in my yeah. lifetime, it went up and it's coming down. Yes, imagine. Yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah. Um, you, you, you designed the same before we came in um, to, to the viewers that... Uh, you, you're responsible for, for doing a lot of designs for stamps and banknotes. Oh, yeah. What, what, what point of your career did that occur? The stamps, quite early on. Yeah, like, that's what I thought. My first, my first, ex, first, my first time I exhibited was in 1967 uh, in the Irish Exhibition of Living Art. Yeah. Uh, and at my first one-person exhibition was in 1969. And it was in 1971 that the, um, I think it was called the, the stamp uh, advisory committee or something. Because okay. in those days, it was the Department of Posts, Posts and Telegraphs mm. that produced the mm. stamps. So this was a government uh, committee, yes. and they asked me to design a, a, a stamp. Mm. And I was kind of amazed. Mm. I was only at the game a few years. Yeah. And uh, I, 
the, the stamp was to, to mark World Meteorological Year. So on the stamp, I did a weather map. Mm -hmm. And it was an early uh, lesson in when, if you do any thing that appears in public, you better be prepared for criticism. Yes. Uh, but believe it or not, the Reverend Ian Paisley raised the issue of the design of my stamp in the House of Commons. No. Because I had done a map of Ireland without a border on it. Oh, <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, fame at last. Uh, indeed. You mentioned in Hansard. You know? Yes, yeah, yeah. So you went on to do quite a number of these. Um, I, over many yeah. years, I did nearly 70 stamps. Really? Uh, I don't think anyone else has done as many. Yeah. Uh, and in when would it have been? The last stamp I did was in 2003. And were these competitive pitches? Uh, or or no, invitation? They were all. They had. They had so many committees. They had a yeah. committee for picking the artists. They did a committee for picking the theme. Yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. These were all, by the way, commemorative stamps. Yes. Uh, the other stamps are called <coughs> definitive stamps, okay. and they last for a long time. Like a commemorative stamp will only be out for a few months. You know? Ah, yes. Okay. And what about the banknotes? That was what they call a, I think, a closed competition. Okay. Where I think of a dozen or a dozen and a half mm -hmm. artists and designers were invited by the central bank mm -hmm. to submit a design for a new 20 pound note. All right, yeah. And uh, I always remember, uh, you know, being delighted to be asked, but uh, yeah. I couldn't get anything going at all. Right. And, uh, I was on the verge of writing to them to apologize that I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I just decided as a last gap, the, the, the subject, by the way, was Daniel O'Connell. Oh, yeah. And every yeah. drawing I did of him I thought was boring and yes. the same as everything else. Mm. And uh, I was rooting around, uh, courtesy of the National Gallery, in their prints collection. Mm. And I found, I thought, a marvellous uh, engraving of Daniel O'Connell mm. by uh, an artist called, I think, John Gubbins. Mm -hmm. uh, not, but I said, I've never seen this before, which yeah. is... Uh, probably would mean that most of the public wouldn't have seen it sure. before. Yes. So that gave me a little bit of uh, incentive to come up with something. And like at the last minute, I finished a design and banged it in and never thought that I would be successful. Yeah, know? yeah. But I was. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and got the commission firstly to do the 10 mm -hmm. or the 20. Yes. And they were, one, happy with the design, obviously, and secondly, I think happy enough with the working relationship I developed with the people because the notes are, are still to this day the euros are printed in Sandyford in the in the, in the printing yeah. work. Of course, they have an Irish sort of element, don't yeah. they? You know, all, all the euros they have their own. Well, not on the notes, but no? in the coins. Yeah. Ah, right. yeah. yeah. But the coins all have a harp on the back of them. Mm. But uh, but that then because they seemed happy enough with me, then I got the next one and the next one and the next one and, and finally the whole series. Oh, was that a reasonably lucrative thing, if I can ask you? Uh, well, certainly compared <laughs> to trying to sell paintings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I had to ask that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about your, your, your painting, your practice in, in painting. Um, you know, were, were you getting commissions or were you oh, well, not doing work off the cuff and holding exhibitions? Not, not in, in, in the beginning. No. Nobody knew who I was. <laughs> Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. And I suppose for a lot of artists of my generation, one of the most significant things was the Rosk exhibition in 1967, mm -hmm. which we saw, you know, very fine examples of yeah. uh, contemporary art in Ireland for the first time, really. Absolutely, yeah. Right. But, but for me, why it was really significant was, I mean, I was aware of, of pop art mm -hmm. uh, and uh, its works and pumps, yeah. but uh, I'd never seen any in, in, in the flesh, so to speak. I know. And at this exhibition in the RDS in 1967, there were paintings by Roy Lichtenstein and Robert Indiana, who were two of the leading pop artists of the day. Mm. And I was really taken with them because yeah. they're both they're both artists who are very, you know, crisp and sleek and yes. uh, did the work really exceptionally well. Mm. But what also excited me about them was that I kind of realized that I could give this a go. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Like if I'd been faced with an exhibition of Rembrandt or The Last Kiss or something, <laughs> I would have been profoundly depressed because I knew I couldn't do that. Yeah. But I knew I could have a go at the pop art thing. Yes. And that was basically my 
uh, entry into making art was sure. I, 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 someone said at the time that I was the, the Ireland's uh, first pop artist, and I replied to that I was Ireland's only pop artist. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was. Uh, I remember seeing Guernica at that exhibition. Do you remember that painting? Was it Picasso's? Yeah, Picasso's. I, was it in it? Oh, I thought it was. No. Was it was not somewhere else. Oh, I saw it somewhere else then. Yeah. 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 Wonderful picture. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, then where did we go? I mean, did, 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 was, was the, the, the design of banknotes well, and all, did that carry on right through your career? As, oh, oh, no. No. Okay. I, I started off <clears> being, uh, you know, when I got the commission to do banknotes, totally inexperienced and no. Uh, you know, no practical knowledge of how to do this at all. Yeah. By the way, they, the notes uh, are printed in Ireland, uh, but uh, the, the plates were made by a, a company in Germany called Gieschige and Debriant, mm -hmm. who at the time made the Deutsche Bank notes and made up bank notes for countries all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, It's a very specific um, mm -hmm. uh, skill of making bank notes. I can uh, imagine, yeah. The, the, the plates for the bank notes. Uh, so I, I went over there, you know, dozens of times mm. and learned so much mm. about also about uh, making the making of the paper, its special paper. Mm. That's, uh, I went to the factory uh, in a place called Luisenthal uh, in, in Bavaria, which, yeah. which, which makes those mm. makes the the banknote paper. Went to Lausanne to another company that makes the security inks because they're special inks used on banknote paper yeah. or on banknotes. Yes, I mean. Learned so much, and yeah. then when I was finished, I, I, I was, I suppose, a skilled banknote designer mm. who would never be called upon to do those <laughs> skills again because I had abandoned making banknotes. Yes, yes, yes. Their own. Yeah. I mean, we, we obviously uh, use the euro mm. and print euros out in Sandyford, but yeah. uh, we yeah. don't have our own banknotes anymore. No, that's right, that's right. So the painting then, where, where did that sort of develop from? Very slowly. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I used all the, uh, the, 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 the vehicles that were available mm. to young artists then, submitting work for submission shows and stuff like that. Yeah. And then ha having a, uh, some uh, exhibitions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, when would it have been? I showed in a few group exhibitions in the David Hendricks Gallery in mm. Stephen's Green. Yes. <clears throat> and then, he gave me a one-person show there, and I developed a very, a very strong relationship with. What David. sort of year are we talking about? Uh, I or think, decade? I think my certainly my first sex mm. successful mm. exhibition with mm. David Hendricks was seventy-two. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and we stuck together with one yeah. another. Eventually, as both a gallery uh, owner and mm. friend, uh, yes. until he died in eighty-three. Yes, know? yes. And then did you move to another gallery or no? no. Okay. After that, uh, I, uh, I didn't mind giving David a percentage of my uh, uh, income yeah. because he was a friend. But more than that, uh, uh, during the, the dark days of uh, trying to become an artist, mm -hmm. uh, I remember there was, there was a routine that just developed that never uh, was never written down on paper or anything. Mm -hmm. But I used to call in any time I was in town to the gallery, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 119 Stevens Green. It's now a restaurant, a steak restaurant. Is it? Yes. But it was. Yeah. And he had his desk between two big Georgian windows, and I would go in. And normally we'd have a chat and everything. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if he was clairvoyant or whatever, mm -hmm. but some days I'd come in and sit down, and the next minute he'd whip out a checkbook and say, How much? It's no, possible. really? Yeah. How he detected that I had no money and that I yes. was impoverished, I don't know. Yeah. And he would write, now in those days it wasn't yeah. big money, but... Uh, oh, it got you by. Just to get by for another month or something. Sure, yeah. He'd write a check, he'd give it to me, wouldn't mention it, I'd put it in my pocket, and not nothing would be spoken about that until uh, I'd sell something and then there would be a, du a du deduction. You know? And that went on for several years. And so I figured he deserved his Oh, money, yeah, you know? absolutely. But I, yeah. I, I just felt, uh, you know, if I signed up with someone else who played no part in my career up to then, they weren't going to get 50% no. of my money. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So I, yeah. have, I yeah. haven't had a gallery since then. Okay, okay. Um, how would you divide your practice between commission 
kind of work that you want to do because you're inspired yourself. You just feel well, you have to get it out on canvas. Yeah. Um, up until this bloody COVID thing, mm. I would say commissioned were took up 80% of right. my time. Yeah. And not just in Ireland, abroad. Just, but that all seems to have ground to a halt. Uh, right. So the work, the work that I've done, certainly in the last two years, has mm. all been my own as a, and okay. concerns. And on that topic, <laughs> shall we look at some of your work? Yeah. But listen, before we do that, I'd love to, to just go through some of your materials and you know, look at your brushes, your paints. I see a load of uh, CDs here. Do you listen to music when you're painting? Do, yeah. Always? Yeah. It's it, funny because I'm intrigued with this. Some people are, are saying, oh God, I couldn't do that. It just you know, it interferes well, with my concentration. I think, um, I mean, you, you can't predict the way you, you, you develop as a human being or whatever. Mm, mm. I, I, you know, like, uh, I mean, I would have listened to mostly well, uh, rock and roll, which was my sure. uh, early passion. I found, find now it's mostly classical music. Yes, you know? yes, yes. And, yeah. uh, and also uh, instrumental. I find, mm. you know, it doesn't matter what kind of music it is. Mm. If it's vocal, it, it can be distracting. Yeah. Yeah, so instrumental music, and I play yes. nearly all the time. Okay, all right, interesting. All right, let's let's wander around, shall we? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, Robert. So, yeah. well, the nearest to hand are your brushes, I see. Yeah, this, uh, the um, I mostly use uh, sables, mm -hmm. little sables, because my work has become quite finely detailed. The, the problem with those is that to do that kind of work, you have to keep. That's not a sable, actually. It, it, yeah. keep a fine point on them and they lose their point fairly quickly mm. so uh, I go through a huge amount of sables and you'll see worn out ones and, and, I mean and they're actually perfectly good except they don't have a point. But Why is that? is that? Is that because oil? I mean you know, would you not use those with watercolour main, mainly sables? No, no. I no? They're oils, oh are they? All right, okay. well, I don't think you're probably not supposed to do that. I don't know. What I mean, I'm, yeah, but when you're doing I'm, very fine stuff, you have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm self-taught, so, yeah. so I break all the rules. Good man. That's, I, that's what I like to hear, yeah. Uh, and also, look, if I'm kind of uh, blocking in stuff, I would use these sort of brushes, you know. I think they're called hogs hairs or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. And uh, uh, it's just that they carry more paint and you can uh, uh, fill in what you're... Coverage. In, yeah. Coverage what you're doing. Yeah. But yep. the, the detailed work would be all, uh, you know, fine sables. Yes. The interesting brushes that I use, uh, which a lot of people don't uh, don't know much about, are uh, these brushes, uh -huh. uh, which are called Badger Softeners. And it was Michael Farrell who, who uh, showed me uh, these these brushes, these kind of brushes. Yes. And uh, he, what he was using them for was. When, his paintings then had kind of Celtic abstract shapes. And in the background, there were kind of cloudy shapes. Uh, 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 and, and he used these to blend the different, you know, uh, tones yeah. together. And the thing about a badger brush is, uh, and I think it's probably because of the nature of the beast mm. that if, now it, he was working with acrylic then. And when I started out, I was working with acrylic paint. Uh, but you, when you're, you 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 blend the the color, uh, the maybe two tones one into the other, and obviously after a little while the the, the brush loads up with paint. Mm -hmm. You you then just if, if it's acrylic, dip it in a bucket of water, give it a few shakes, and it's uh, dry and ready to continue with the blending. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I'm changed over to using oil paints, uh, I found they they perform just as well with oil paint mm -hmm. and. Uh, and uh, I use them to do all sorts of uh, uh, glazing and blending and all mm, sorts mm. of things. And for years, people used to think that I, I uh, used an airbrush to create effects. Yes. Which at the time would have been impossible because mm. I had a studio on the top floor in Parliament Street for 13 years mm. with no electricity. <laughs> so <laughs> unless, Not an option. unless I had a big long cable to... Uh, generator on the ground floor yes i wasn't going to be able to use uh, no but but some of some of the finishes actually do look as if they are yeah. so that's how you achieve it's that it's all done with uh, badger brushes. badger yeah. amazing badger sauce and, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't be buying those in art shops 
No. You buy these brushes in stores that specialize in decorators' tools. And, yeah. You know, uh, um, it, and also, I, I bought some of these in, in France mm. and in other countries as well. I believe that's one of your passions is to, in, when, when, you're, when you're away foreign, is to seek out all these art shops and interior shops. And, yeah, I, yeah. I, found, uh, I found a great place in Paris years ago. Mm -hmm. And another uh, technique I use is... Sorry, before we go on to that, Robert, can yeah. I just mention about the brushes? Oh, yeah, sure. That um, th these don't come cheap. No, no, they're a bit expensive. Yeah, yeah, so roughly, what are you talking? Well, I haven't bought one for a while because I look after them very carefully. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> one like that probably costs you 7,500 euros. Yeah. Maybe yeah. more. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. With the cost of living the way it's going at the moment, probably more. Probably more, yes, yes. No, I just thought we'd point that out. Okay, we were on rollers. Yeah, yeah. some people wonder how uh, I achieve some effects, mostly in backgrounds and things like that, mm -hmm. and they think it's very carefully done or whatever. In fact, um, what I do is I mask out the area that uh, I want to concentrate on, and then uh, use a, a roller to roll the paint on and... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I bought this roller, I think, somewhere in Paris many, many years ago. Yes. And uh, uh, I was a kind of regular visitor to Paris then because I was on a UNESCO arts committee and our headquarters were in UNESCO building in Paris. No, no. And this particular shop was quite near and I bought a few things there. And uh, uh, it, you can create some quite interesting effects very simply just by rolling the paint. Uh, yeah. And uh, so the... Wasn't, was it the last time I was in Paris? Or certainly a, a year? No, obviously before all of this COVID mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. I went and I found one of those shops and I bought loads of them. <laughs> Some of which I haven't tried yet. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. But Yeah, uh, and they're the sort of the substitute for wallpaper, aren't they? Well, I think, sort of... I think that's what they were originally yeah. in, in, invented for. Yeah. And presumably you could make up some of those if you were ah, adept to yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, let's just talk about paint for a second, because I see there's, there's paints here that you probably see would, in a decorator's place. Because would, they... they could be left over from painting the house. You know? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's a, a, a mixed bag. But, Is it all right? But I'm, I'm, I mostly <clears throat> use uh, oil paints from tubes. Yeah. Any particular brand that you're fond of? I use Windsor and Newton most of the time. Okay. Uh, unless there's a specific color that they don't carry. Yes, yes. And I use Liquin as a, a medium. Mm -hmm. uh, I use that largely because the way I work, uh, uh, after I've, I've kind of laid down the, 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 the what I want to paint, mm -hmm. and then all the tones are built up. And... Uh, Traditional oil glazes with liquid, uh, with uh, linseed oil, takes so long to dry. Mm. Whereas uh, a glaze based on liquid, which is a Windsor and Newton product, uh, will dry in a day or two days yes. maximum. Yes. So yeah. you can move a picture along a little bit quicker. Okay. We're just going to take a break there for a second because my battery is going and I want to plug it in and then be able to run around the room. Let's have a look at some of the work now uh, in studio that you're either I should, currently. I, I should say. Yes. Yeah. My studio isn't normally packed out with pictures like this, but... Uh, no, well, we asked. We asked. <laughs> or, no, you asked, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, where would you like to start? I don't mind. Let's start over here. The earliest one is, <clears throat> is, is this one here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a portrait of uh, Michael O'Reardon, who was chairman of the Communist Party of Ireland for 40 years. Yes. But the reason for the portrait <laughs> is not just that, mm -hmm. but I had a studio... I, I mentioned earlier, in Parliament Street for 13 years. Yes. And uh, just around the corner, and this is all before the whole Temple Bar thing happened, mm. uh, there was a, a, a bar in Temple Bar called yeah. uh, Timmins, which I used to occasionally uh, repair to for a pint. Yeah. And the Communist uh, Party headquarters was in East Essex Street, and Mick O'Reardon used to drink there, oh, and right. I got to know him quite well. Yes. And I, the idea of painting... Uh, you know, doing a portrait of someone who was held in such disregard in our <laughs> society, I found really interesting. Yes. So, uh, yeah. and, and the quirky thing about this is I decided to portray him in a kind of religious iconic form. Okay. Uh, yeah. Someone who was seen as next to the devil by certainly large sections of the Irish population. Yes. 
the, oh, the funny thing, uh, it, it, I, I asked Mick to model for this, and mm -hmm. uh, I asked him, uh, I wanted to maybe put a medal on it or two, and, and he said, I've been awarded 40 medals by the Soviet <laughs> Union, and I blanched at the thought of having to paint 40 medals. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and, but he said, I only want one. And mm. he said, that's for survivors of the Spanish Civil War. And that's right. that medal there. Yes. And the other thing, uh, he always he always had pencils and pens in his top, his top pocket. pocket. Yeah. And uh, uh, several people said, oh, how, I'd love a tie like that. I'm afraid I invented the tie. He didn't have a tie like more, that. More more merchandising opportunities, yeah. Robert. <laughs> Now, I noticed the background here. Yeah, you can see this sort of stipple. That would have been done with the roller. With your roller, yeah. 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 And it's a wonderful finish. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Okay. And the one below? I did. Uh, I, I was asked to do a show in Wexford, the Wexford Arts Centre in 2010. And it was they were the people, actually, who suggested a series of self-portraits. Mm. So I did eight self-portraits for that exhibition. That's one of the eight there. Mm -hmm. uh, they were um, unusual for me in that most of my portraits have various things uh, that tell you more about the sitter, uh, maybe a book they've written, yes. something like that. Th th this series of, of self-portraits, uh, I decided there would be nothing mm -hmm. uh, other than the, the person unadorned. I even, well, I started off, uh, I, I worked with a photographer to, to get the reference material and we started off and I was wearing a shirt and a tie mm. or whatever. And I said, no, no, we lose that. And then I, I lost the glasses and I lost everything. And there's, there's just the person. You lost your shirt. Lost my shirt, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, again, you can see the, the stipple in the background here is done with... Uh, I think uh, sponges. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it's yes. Another, another yeah. technique yeah. I've used. And I love the 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 background to it. It's sort of a velvety yeah. background, which yeah. looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah, mm. lovely. Shall we go on to um, to Fidel? Fidel, yeah. Uh, this was this is actually a commission. An, mm -hmm. an English collector commissioned me to do this portrait of Fidel. And he, now Fidel was still alive at the time, mm -hmm. and he. Uh, uh, he asked that it be of Fidel as an old man, not as, uh, you know, the archetypal mm. image we have of him in military fatigues and smoking a cigar and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. So I decided to do him uh, as uh, uh, an older man uh, surrounding himself with the red flag uh, and uh, the... Um, I was kind of influenced by... Uh, uh, Velasquez has a marvellous uh, series of paintings of old people. Uh, there's one of a guy uh, uh, who's supposed to be a a Aesop and his fables. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was those kind of pictures that really caught my, my imagination. So that's what I tried to achieve here. Yes. Uh, I did, by the way, try... Um, I, I, I contacted the Cuban embassy and mm. said, I, I'd love to do this from life. Could I go out to Havana? <laughs> and they said, uh, actually, uh, the, the president is not well. And so far this year, he's only seen the Chinese premier mm. and the premier of Vietnam. So I reckon that wasn't in the running. Not in the running, no. So I didn't get out to see him. But it, interestingly enough, years before... Uh, uh, I was contacted by Sinn Féin to say that Jerry Adams was going on a state visit to uh, Cuba mm -hmm. and he wanted to bring a, 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 a print as a present for the president. Oh, right, yes. So uh, I, he asked me would I sign the, the print and I signed it in, in Spanish. I know a little bit of Spanish. And uh, uh, one of the phrases that... Castro used, I think, is hasta la victoria siempre. Um, so I put that on it and whatever. And when Adams came back, he contacted me and said that the uh, the president was terribly impressed with the print and he would hang it in his office. Fantastic. And so yeah. I said, yeah. they all say that. Yeah. 
And a couple of years later, uh, I was at a function and I met the, the new Cuban ambassador mm -hmm. uh, who was introduced to me as Cuban ambassador to Ireland. And he said, oh, well, I know your work. And I said, how do you know my work? I've never exhibited in mm -hmm. Cuba. And he said, well, I mean, I know one of your pieces. And he said, I said, oh, hi. He said, oh, it hangs behind the president's Ooh. desk. <laughs> <laughs> so he meant what he said, you know. Certainly, yes. But uh, the funny thing about this was that a, a, a later uh, uh, Cuban ambassador, mm. uh, uh, or an earlier, it doesn't matter whether it's earlier mm. or later, a woman, uh, Maria was her name, and uh, I, I showed her a photograph of this painting, and she said, oh, it's marvellous, but there's one thing wrong. And I, I said, what? And she said, those legs are of a younger man than Fidel, <laughs> because they're my legs. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> Wonderful! It's fantastic. So that 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 was commissioned. That was commissioned, and it yes. just hasn't left yet. The the guy, is an English collector, mm. he's now in the process of uh, either lending it or giving it to an Irish institution. Oh, really? So yeah. So it'll stay in Ireland. I see. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful picture. Yeah. Okay. What would you like to discuss next? Well, uh, more branding opportunities. More branding opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great story. Today. Sorry, that's why I said it. Yeah. Maybe you'd fill everyone in on that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> this picture was was in response to um, an eminent member of the Irish art establishment on television announced that I wasn't a real artist; that I was a mere illustrator. So uh, I, I said, "How can I respond to that?" Well, the only way I can respond to things is through art. <laughs> So I, I came up with the idea of this uh, picture, which is called The Illustrator. Ah, yes. uh, and uh, and the, my sentiments about people who disapprove of my kind of work is written on the T-shirt. The, the amusing thing was that the, the, the actual picture didn't sell. That's why I still have it in the studio. But I had a lot of requests for the T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I, I didn't follow up. Maybe I should have. Maybe, maybe you should. <laughs> maybe you should. Wonderful. Okay. And to, to make a, um, a frame like that, just on, on a technical note, must be quite awkward, is it? Well, I, ha I normally use professional framers, but yeah. there are certain projects that I would be too embarrassed to even ask them to do. It. Yes. And I made that frame myself. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. That's great. Fantastic. With enormous difficulty. I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Okay, shall we go on to this one here? Yeah, uh, this one is called Savonarola. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, um, I don't know if many people know who Savonarola was. But I don't. He was uh, a, a Dominican friar in the 16th century in Florence mm -hmm. who preached in favor of modesty and against extravagance. And he staged uh, a bonfire of... Uh, uh, luxurious goods, mm -hmm. clothes, furniture, paintings, etc. Interesting thing when I read a bit about him is uh, that Michelangelo was a follower mm -hmm. and uh, he staged what became known as a bonfire of vanities. Oh, where all of these yeah. luxurious items were burnt in a city square in Florence and apparently uh, Botticelli gave him a few pictures to burn. Mm -hmm. But uh, he fell foul of the Pope anyway, and he himself was burnt at the stake. Gosh. But this painting is called Savonarola, uh, which uh, is obviously after him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's obviously a comment about paintings. That, uh, by the way, I should say, I have no objection to anything that artists do. That's mm. their business. Mm. What I do, what niggles me is people making claims for paintings that are not necessarily true or mm. whatever like you know you you, you look at a, an abstract painter like mark rothko mm -hmm. and i've read essays comparing him to uh, the sublime as described by edmund burke and that yeah. uh, you know these are statements about the human condition and everything and i believe that's a vanity yes so, yes that these are, are you know interesting mm. abstract paintings of abstract things and mm. abstract shapes. Mm. They are not, in my book, uh, detailing the workings of the human soul mm. and things like that. No. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely get what you're saying. And uh, interesting, I think I read somewhere that in terms of, of uh, um, no, it wasn't, it was Jackson Pollock um, that I heard this, that he never titled his work 
but his dealer did. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and he, he started to do exactly what you're talking about uh, because it added value to um, what it was. But anyway, so that's it. And that's finished now, is it? That's finished. Yeah. 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 And what's the significance of the, uh, the upside down canvas in the bottom? Well, it's that goes outside the frame. It's falling. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a kind of. I love playing around because mm. painting is essentially a two dimensional art form, and I enjoy uh, occasionally breaking through that two dimensional yes. plane uh, into the third dimensions. Mm. So that canvas is kind of falling out, and is it escaping the vanities, or is it part of the vanities? I don't know. Escaping. I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, we have two more and then we go to Q&A. Yeah, well, this this is a commissioned portrait mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Owen O'Brien, Dr. Owen O'Brien, who's a leading uh, Irish cardiologist and medical man. And uh, it was commissioned by UCD, uh, still waiting to go up. Uh, I suppose we have to wait for the COVID thing to uh, uh, go away before he gets... Uh, properly hung in, mm -hmm. in, in UCD, but it, uh, the, the really interesting, I mean, obviously he's of enormous significance medically, mm -hmm. but the, what was really interesting uh, to me about Owen is he was a personal friend of Samuel Beckett's and, and uh, uh, frequently visited him in Paris. So I have in his pocket uh, uh, the first edition of En Attendant Godot, Waiting for Godot. <laughs> yes. Uh, and there's an interesting side story to that because I did a portrait many years ago of Noel Brown. Mm -hmm. And in that, I decided to break the picture plane with uh, some stones and with some books. Mm. And uh, I asked Noel Brown to nominate the authors that he would like uh, in the books. Mm -hmm. And he picked uh, Samuel Beckett and Karl Marx. <laughs> oh, <don't I>? yeah. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, when Noel saw the picture, uh, he, I said, what do you think? He said, oh, it's very good. But he was um, a very kind of diffident uh, man, uh, held his emotions, etc. So afterwards I was saying, did he like the portrait or did he not? I don't mm. know. And a couple of days later, I got in the post, a first edition of Waiting for Godot from really? Noel Brown. Yeah. and just said, thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> And am I right in saying that that's in the National Gallery? It is, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pop apparently very popular. With the yes, public, yes, yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So yeah. that's actually a, a copy, <clears throat> a, you know, a, mm. a graphic copy of the, the uh, copy of Waiting for Godot that mm. Noel Brown gave me. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. That's something, yeah. Okay, and finally, let's look at this picture. Yeah, Tell us about that. This is... a. a Kind of graphic representation of Bloody Sunday in Derry in 1972. I did this picture, uh, you know, during the lockdown uh, because uh, I was aware that January next year will be the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Mm. So uh, this painting will actually be unveiled in Derry uh, at the time of the, uh, the anniversary. Yes. And uh, just want to show the extent of it there. Yeah, it's, it's quite, quite it's a lot. Quite, quite big. It's yeah. eight foot by six foot. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, Robert, that was fascinating. Look, thank you so much for that. I think what we do now is we go to Q and A. I'm not sure what the time is. Where's my floor manager? What time is it? Three minutes to eleven. Yeah. Say hello to everyone, Trina. Hi. <laughs> the brains behind everything. Um, so I'm going to read out a few comments that have been made okay. uh, first. Colin Eaton. Fascinating. Thank you, Robert and Alan. Hugely enjoyed the tour, the materials on the stories and uses, and of course, the works. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Tim Goulding. Uh, hi, Tim. David was the most generous hearted man I knew. Oh, this is David Hendricks, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and supported so many of us young artists at the time. Badly missed. Uh, Marianne says, fascinating program. Very enjoyable. Thank you, Robert and Alan. Colin, apart from the work itself, it's always fascinating uh, listening to great stories and reminiscences, reminiscences uh, behind the commissioning of and execution of uh, and life thereafter of the works. Uh, Yvonne, saw your latest work at the RHA, highly recommended. I also have been a follower of your work for decades. 
Thank you for sharing some of your techniques. And that's from Yvonne Maloney O'Keefe. Uh, Catherine Gagan says, very enjoyable interview, Robert and Alan. Thanks, Robert, for being so generous with the information about your tools and materials. Um, Liam Madden says, fascinating. An hour is not nearly enough time. <laughs> He's right. Um, Alico, fascinating interview and amazing work. Thanks, Alico. Claire Halpman, great interview, lovely chat. Thanks, Robert and Alan. An hour too short. Um, Eilish says, uh, another brilliant episode. Thank you, Robert and Alan. And Katie Kay, my daughter, wonderful. Thank you so much. So um, if anyone would like to ask a question in person, um, if you just unmute yourself, uh, and you can ask or make a comment, and then please remute yourself after that so somebody else can come in. Um, I um, was just wondering, actually, for a, a question. Um, sure. I know it's probably been said already and answered, but for what inspired you to do all these um, brilliant paintings and... Um, what inspired you to choose the theme of um, those kind of the the type of art that you were? Yeah, um, yeah, no, very very good question, Gillian. Yeah. So basically, what inspires you to do certain types of work? Because there is there are themes to everything, aren't there? Yeah. You know, there's a story behind every single one of them. Yeah. You know, is this something that sort of kind of hits you one day and you say, right, that's it, I'm going to do it. Probably, uh, you know those t times at about five in the morning you wake up <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and something strikes you, mm. that, that can be it. Uh, or else it can be something that's nagging at you for years and you finally get around to doing something about it. Yeah. That's the way I find it works. Uh, uh, <clears throat> obviously, commissions are completely different. The, the struggle is not yeah. to, what, what to do, but how to do it. You know, sure. when, mm. when you're asked by a client, whatever, do whatever. I mean, yes. I've had mad commissions. One of the best ever was uh, to paint uh, the Fastnet Lighthouse. <laughs> and and uh, Irish Lights, uh, I said, how am I going to do that? You know, can you get me photographs of it? And they said, we can do something better. We can fly you out in a helicopter. <laughs> wow. so, Did you do it? Yeah. yeah. My first <laughs> and last time in a helicopter. Yes. Very exciting. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, we got out there and uh, in quite a small helicopter and it was delivering to uh, lighthouse men that mm. was before they were all uh, run by machines yeah automated yeah automated. yeah and the, the um so the two lads get out got out but i had to get out of the front seat to let them out yes and then i got back in and then the pilot said to me we have 10 minutes now i have permission for 10 minutes to fly you around to take photos yeah now i was clever enough i'd asked her professional photographer of mine, how in the name of goodness can I do this? Yeah. And he, he said, of course, you have to use a very fast shutter speed, sure. etc. And like a that. harness in case you fall out the window. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> ah, really? Because so, yeah. we were flying around and I was taking photographs, but it was one of those helicopters with a kind of perspex domey thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was getting a lot of shine on the thing. And I said to the pilot, is there anything? And he said, oh, you can pull that back. You know? So yeah. I pulled it back. And I was leaning out and taking my photographs, yeah. and I suddenly realized my harness wasn't attached. And uh, <laughs> when I had the fellas out and got back in again, I forgot to. Uh, so I didn't say anything, and I slipped back <laughs> very carefully, connected it, and yeah. told nobody until now. <laughs> really? Very embarrassing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, one question. It is, I mean, if any, any of you have a question, please just, just interrupt me. But um, one thing I always ask the artists at the end is uh, if they were to be given any or, or be offered any particular painting or sculpture or anything uh, in the world, or be it in a private collection or in a museum, uh, that they'd love to have over their mantelpiece at home and admire, what would it be? Money, no object. Oh, I don't have a moment's hesitation, but it wouldn't fit over my mantelpiece. Yeah. Uh, I need to build a room for it, and that's Las Meninas by Velasquez, oh. finest image <laughs> ever painted. Yes, yes, yes. I think you're not the first person to choose that. Probably not. Yeah, yeah. No. just shows that. Yeah, I occasionally exhibit good taste. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. Okay. Anybody else got a question? I have. Owen, hi, Owen. How are you? Yeah. yeah um... Are you there? I can't see you. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, you can see him. Sorry. All right. Off you go, Owen. Sorry. 
No, it's a really interesting interview today. Thank you very much. And um, I like the, a lot of the work is very um, political, and um, I like that. I think it's, it makes it much more interesting for me. And anyway. but I wanted to ask um, what Robert thought about making art that is political. Um, does he think it has an effect on on the viewers or? Um, <coughs> You know, that kind of area. I often hear um, stuff about art shouldn't be political. I just wanted to hear what Robert would say about that. Well, the first thing I'd say is I don't think um, we should ever say that any kind of art is illegitimate uh, because uh, a lot of people try to do that from the Nazis to other, and uh, all art is legitimate. That doesn't mean all art is great, but all art is legitimate. The question of political art, well, what do you mean by political art? What do any of us mean? Uh, Brian O'Doherty is a well-known Irish artist and writer. He wrote an essay uh, about, uh, it was actually about my portrait of Michael Farrell, but in it he spoke about uh, Robert Bala and he said, Robert Bala's art is not political art, it's art made by a very political person. Uh, more or less defines it uh, that uh, I don't set out to make political art ever. Sometimes it ends up political with a small p, maybe with a bigger p on occasions. But essentially, I'm set, setting out to try and make art. But I happen to be someone who has uh, quite strong political opinions, which is bound, bound to influence what you do. Robert, Shock Keshtas Goyega, Cain Fog will never should stay shot with saying Goyega. Das Goyega, can you? Are you? Yeah, I did. Um, I, 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 I did an exhibition a few years ago. I, one of the themes I never uh, tackled was um, uh, the Irish landscape. So I did an exhibition some years ago, which uh, uh, attempted to tackle the Irish landscape, but in tandem with Seanachal's proverbs uh, in Irish. Uh, so every picture had a, a Seanachal accompanying it. And uh, that, that, that's been my uh, single, I suppose, uh, contribution made to language with visual art. Yeah. Can I ask uh, a question about the, uh, the banknotes? As yeah, who's to that? Seamus. Seamus. Yeah. Hi, Seamus. Yeah, off about, you um, was there much guidance from uh, official sources in that? And the reason I asked that is because I remember talking to someone who was on the, was it the Series B notes committee in the department? And they were instructed from on high that the map of the Blaskets was to exclude a particular island. I have to say, I didn't have uh, any experiences like that, but... Uh, there were several uh, informal uh, discussions, and uh, I, w I was told that um, under pain of mortal sin and execution, uh, because uh, obviously my reputation for slipping certain things into pictures that you don't notice when you look at it for the first time, they said <laughs> if they discovered that I had slipped something into a banknote that would embarrass the nation afterwards, <laughs> I would be in serious trouble. But apart from that general uh, warning, shall we say, I didn't have any uh, problems at all in terms of, if we could call it censorship or uh, et cetera. The, um, the thing that I got criticized a lot for uh, was, I don't know, the public obviously don't understand how these things happen, et cetera. But why did I pick to put a nun on the five pound note? Uh, Catherine McCauley was on five pound note. I didn't pick any of the people who were on the notes. The, the central bank actually had a committee to do that, which was separate from the design committee. Mm. So uh, there, there was a lot of people involved in the decisions. Uh, so when I when I came on board, all the, the people on the notes had been selected before I got involved. Mm. And undoubtedly, if I had the choice, I might have picked different people. I have to say, all of the people on the series of notes I did, I have, didn't have a problem with, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Daniel O'Connell was a giant of the 19th century. Catherine McCauley, 
interestingly enough, I didn't know a lot about her, uh, did an enormous amount of work for particularly poor girls uh, in terms of education and healthcare, etc. And uh, uh, I mean, obviously, Parnell was a giant of, of the political scene who was on the hundred pound note and Douglas Hyde was the first president of Ireland. So I didn't have a problem with any of the, James Joyce obviously was, was a significant figure. Uh, yeah. I had a, a bit of difficulty with James Joyce in that, and I don't know if you'd call this, I wouldn't call it censorship, but I was told that uh, the, 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 the image of James Joyce, the bank wanted him smiling on, on it. Mm. And I looked at every photograph I could find of James Joyce and I couldn't find one of them smiling. <laughs> so I had to invent a smile, a yeah. wry smile for James Joyce. And then the other thing they said was they wanted to see his eyes. Uh, and anyone who knows uh, about Joyce and his pro problematic eyesight, mm -hmm. he had big thick glasses and you never would have seen his yeah. you know, actual eyes. Uh, so. Yeah. I suppose the portrait is slightly inaccurate in that, uh, but it's not my fault that it's inaccurate. No. And I remember his uh, grandson, Stephen <coughs> Joyce, was asked, uh, what did he think of uh, the portrait on the £10 note? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, Mr. Bala has his idea of my grandfather. I have mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's telling you. That's telling you. Anybody else got a question? Yeah, a question on um, civil rights. Uh, yes, Derek. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Um, That's all right, so, I know you. <laughs> but so, Sunday, bloody Sunday. Would that work be a political statement or an historical statement? Um, I think it's a historical statement. Uh, the, uh, there's no politics left in it. I mean, it has been... Uh, uh, or, or maybe the politics are continuing. You probably saw that the other day, the one soldier who was going to be prosecuted mm -hmm. isn't going to be prosecuted. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's much bigger, I think, than politics. It's a, certainly for someone of my generation. I mean, I remember uh, on the whenever the the day after joining the, the 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 march to the British Embassy in Dublin, and at the time my daughter was very small, and my wife and myself were pushing her along in a one of those push chairs or baby buggies mm. to the embassy and huge, I think a quarter of a million people marched in Dublin uh, who were so outraged by what happened. And uh, and you will know from history that the crowd burnt the embassy down. Mm -hmm. But uh, my wife and myself, uh, when things were getting slightly uh, dangerous, mm. we looked at the, at the daughter in the baby buggy and said, I think we should go home now. Yeah. Yeah. So we weren't actually there when it burnt down the yes. embassy. But it was a, a very significant event, uh, mm. certainly in my life and in most people's lives who are of my generation. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in 1972, when the event happened in, in, in Derry, later that year, I did a piece in, in the Living Art Exhibition, which was about Bloody Sunday as well. Mm. And uh, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people responded uh, you know, so, you know, some with art, some with other uh, uh, methods. I mean, I, I remember reading the book uh, about the, the hunger strikes in 1981. And the fascinating thing about that was nearly every one of the hunger strikers who died, 10 of them, the reason they joined the physical force uh, movement was because of Bloody Sunday. So yes, it, yes. it was a really significant event in, in, in <coughs> Well, 50 years ago yeah. now. Yeah. So for all those reasons, I decided to try and do something about it now mm -hmm. and, and kind of close the circle because I did something about it in 1972. So mm -hmm. I'm doing something of, uh, about it 50 yeah. years later. Okay, and there's a few other questions if I could just put them in there uh, or comments, I should say, for Miss Trotting. Jasmine. Dad, Desmond. Dad, Desmond. Desmond, have, have to leave. Enjoy the interview. Trina Sweeney, thank you so much. It was inspirational. Um, does Robert have any observations on the opportunities for artists to show their work today in contrast to when he was setting out as an artist? Great question. Yeah. I was, I was I going to ask you something similar to that. I think it's harder. To yeah, say. it must be. I think yeah. it is. I, I think young people, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I, well, one of the advantages, I suppose, when I started out in the late 60s was there were so few of us. Mm. And 
you know, there were more opportunities, like uh, there was the Living Art Exhibition, there was the Arachthus Art Exhibition. There were loads of these submission shows that mm. at least you get an outing. Now, yes. the, it seems to me there's only yeah. the Royal Hibernian Academy and nothing else. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's, it's not enough, in my opinion. No. You know? no, but and I also, also yeah. I mean, like when, when I was young, I mean, I didn't go to art college, so I had no involvement in that world. Mm. But I mean, a hundred or so graduates a year, there must be thousands now, you know? Yes. Uh, yes. And, you know, the job opportunities aren't any better now than they were then. Yeah. So it's, it's a very difficult situation mm. for young people. Yeah. I think people need to look beyond their own doorstep. Yeah. Do you know, if they're, if they're going to make a career for it, of it, yeah. they, they really have to see beyond the Irish market. Well, that's basically uh, mm. what Irish artists have done since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, oh, look at all our great writers. Well, that's true. Yes, they yes. They all left. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One would have hoped. I mean, that was one of the, <clears throat> the things that, uh, you know, when I decided to come back from my brief sojourn in London mm. was not only to become an artist, but to try and improve the situation that artists wouldn't have to emigrate in the future. Yeah. Yes. And that's why I got involved in lots of organizations campaigning for the arts, campaigning particularly for the visual arts, because mm. we, I mean, it, the actors had actors' equity and the other uh, professions had some sort of representative mm. groups. We never had any. Yeah. until we started the Artists Association in the 1980s. That's gone now. Uh, you know, we've struggled to, mm. to, to be listened to even. Yes, know? yes. Yeah, well, it's an absolute issue, yeah. Okay, um, if, uh, are there any other questions before we wrap up today? Can I say hello to Bobby? Alan? Yes. Oh, hi, Bobby. Um, just Who's that? To, Sorry. Just really thank you for a wonderful... Um, eloquent <laughs> exploration of your journey and um, the paintings. Are, I, love, I love the bonfire of the vanity, of the vanities of Savonarola and I love the stories all along the way and also the fact that all art is legitimate. I think that's a, that's a wonderful statement from whatever corner we come from and I just really enjoyed it and thank a million. <laughs> thank you. Thanks Tim, that's great, thank you very much. OK, listen, we're going to leave it there. I mean, we've only t tipped the iceberg or the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of, of your work and, and your career. But um, it's been wonderful talking to you. And thank you so much for inviting us in to your studio, um, which I know is, is, is a very you know, unique thing uh, to be able to do. Um, so uh, thank you all. And thank you all for watching as well. And I know there's going to be a lot more people on the video later on. So thank you also to them for, for, for logging in and watching. Um, next week, we are going down back down to Kilkenny, to that hotbed of creativity, to meet yet another artist. We've only three more artists to meet um, before the end of this particular series. So I, I hope you join us next Saturday. Um, but in the meantime, thank you, Robert, so much for, for your generosity and for, for your time. No problem. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.